Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Gerald McKeegan. I'm up at the, or I'm actually not up at the Chabot Space and Science Center, but this is the Chabot Space and Science Center's uh, Sky This Month program. And like I say, I am not up at the Chabot Space and Science Center right now. Uh, as a lot of you know, uh, Chabot is uh, subject to the, uh, the stay-at-home order, just like uh, everyone else in the Bay Area. So I am at home. Uh, now, it may look like I've gone back in time to, uh, you know, New York in 1998 or something like that, but that's actually what you see behind me is uh, a mural on the wall of my daughter's bedroom. Uh, it's a full wall mural, and it's pretty cool. So I thought I'd use that as a background instead. So uh, we got a little program for you tonight. We're going to show you a video about uh, what's up uh, tonight in the night sky. We'll talk about the conjunction that's coming up. Um, but before we do that, I want to make sure that you're all aware that Chabot, this is giving season for Chabot. So uh, Chabot is encouraging all of you to uh, donate uh, to Chabot if you can. Uh, you can do that in several ways. There's a donate button on the Facebook page. You can go to the uh, Chabot website, which is ChabotSpace.org. And you can uh, click on the donate button that's at the top of the, the page at the Chabot website. Uh, and a, another way you can help support us is by uh, becoming a Chabot member. Uh, in fact, we have a program going on right now between now and the end of the month uh, where if you sign up as a Chabot member, Chabot will match your membership with a free membership for a local teacher. So you'll be supporting a local teacher along with Chabot. Now, Chabot is closed uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, we are going to reopen sometime again next year. Uh, in the meantime, we're doing a lot of the virtual programming that you're tuned into now. And uh, we do a virtual telescope program on Saturday nights. And we do some daytime programming, science programming, uh, including uh, programs for schools. So we still need support for all that activity. And since we have no uh, revenue from ticket sales, uh, we, we have to uh, rely primarily on donations. So if you can help us out, we'd really appreciate it. <clears throat> also wanted to remind you about one other thing. Uh, coming up on December 31st, New Year's Eve at 11 o'clock AM, we are going to host a balloon drop to celebrate the new year. Uh, this has been an annual event that we actually do at Chabot uh, every year, and it's a really a lot of fun. We, uh, we blow up hundreds of balloons and then suspend them over a rotunda, and then lots of kids uh, gather around underneath, and we release the balloons uh, at 11 o'clock, and then we do it again at 4 o'clock, which is uh, midnight in England, and... Uh, celebrate the new year. Now, unfortunately, we can't do that live uh, this year. So we're going to do a virtual program at 11 o'clock on the 31st. Uh, and you can sign up for that. Uh, there's a little bit of information about it on Chabot's uh, Facebook page. Uh, but to sign up for it, you need to go to the Chabot website. Again, that's ChabotSpace.org. And I believe uh, you need to uh, uh, go to the events page and um, uh, sign up there for the, the uh, balloon drop. So check that out. And it's a lot of fun for kids. And uh, hopefully we'll get to do it live again next year. All right. So uh, I want to get started here. Uh, we're going to start out with a video that we're going to show you. This is a video produced by Don Saito, who is one of our longtime Chabot volunteers. He's an astronomer, and he's also very much into doing video production. So he has put together a video for us about what we can expect to see in the night sky over the next couple of weeks. So. Bear with me for a second here while I uh, switch to that video. Greetings, fellow Earthlings. Due to this rotten pandemic, we still can't meet inside our amazing Zeiss Planetarium 
at the Chabot Space and Science Center. However, that doesn't mean we can't use nature's planetarium, also known as the real sky, to dress up warmly, step outside, tilt our heads back, and see at least some of the amazing things I'll be pointing out to you tonight. I am, of course, talking about the constellations. There are people, animals, and objects up in the night sky. They've been there for millennia, but most people are unaware of them as they glide by unnoticed right over our heads every clear night. Tonight, we'll amend this sad state of affairs and put you, the audience, on your first steps toward astronomical enlightenment. Let us begin. As you probably already know, the Earth has four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. Well, the constellations also have seasons, having to do with the Earth's yearly orbital path around the sun. That, and the fact that we can only see stars by looking away from the sun at night, which changes our view of the stars throughout the year. Unfortunately, unless you're at a good dark sky site, and if the moon isn't too bright, most constellations will be somewhat hard to see fully. But most constellations have at least a few bright stars to help identify them, and the better your viewing location, the more you'll be able to see. A good first step to finding the constellations is done by knowing your compass directions. We can easily do this without a compass, using a star grouping that is quite easy to find, Cassiopeia, the Queen, also known as the Big W. Face the sky, roughly 90 degrees to the right of where the sun had set, and look almost straight up to the top of the sky, and you'll see it. As you can see, Cassiopeia has five stars that make up the W shape, which is actually her throne. From this angle, it's kind of face down. This sixth star makes up the seat of the throne, which can be seen to have a rather unergonomic back. Off the tip of the more squashed end of the W, you might see another somewhat faint seventh star. Just connect the end of the W to that star and extend the line about two and a half times until it comes to the semi-bright star known as Polaris, also known as the North Star. It's the only star in the entire sky that stays pretty much right where it is, so no matter what time of night it is, or even what month of the year it is, all you need to do is face it, and you'll always be facing due north, with east directly to your right, west directly to your left, and south directly behind you. All the other stars wheel around this pivot point anti-clockwise, making them appear to rise in the east and set in the west. This is, of course, an illusion caused by the Earth's rotation, which gives the appearance that the stars are moving, when in fact it's the Earth that's spinning. If you think of the Earth as a spinning top, and you extend Earth's north polar axis straight up into the sky, it points almost directly at Polaris. Using Polaris, we found all the compass directions, but Polaris is also the end of the Little Dipper's handle, whose official name is Ursa Minor, the Little Bear, and our next constellation. It's a bit faint, but from Polaris, you might be able to trace its curving handle to its bowl. The two brighter stars at the end of the bowl are called the Guardians, because they seem to march around the North Star like protective sentries throughout the night. Using the non-squashed end of Cassiopeia, it points directly into the face of our next constellation, Cepheus, the king. And yes, he is Cassiopeia's husband. At this time of night, he's face up, but he's got a triangular crown, a squarish head with a pigtail at the base of his head, and he's smiling, because he's the king. Rising midway up the northeastern horizon, we find Auriga, the charioteer. He's easy to spot because of his bright eye star, Capella. It's just his head in profile, but he's got a triangular hat, a hooked nose, his bright eye, Capella, and the rest of his large head with a big, manly chin. To continue, let's turn our view to the south, like so. This will flip everything we've seen so far upside down and will enable us to find the rest of the night's major constellations more easily. To find our next constellation, let's first look for the asterism known as the Great Square. 
By the way, an asterism is not a constellation, merely a familiar star grouping. The brightest star of the square is the head of Andromeda, the chained lady. She's got one star as her head, a torso, and one arm pointing out away from her body with a couple of chains attached. The other foreshortened arm is curled down below, and she has one straight leg while the other leg is up and bent at the knee. If your sky is dark enough, you might see a dim fuzzy spot just off her knee. Binoculars would make it plain to see, even in somewhat light-polluted skies. That's the Andromeda Galaxy, our nearest neighboring spiral galaxy, at 2.5 million light-years from us, which makes it the furthest object that can be seen with the naked eye. It's on a collision course with our own Milky Way galaxy, but worry not. The collision won't happen for another five billion years, give or take a few hundred million. The other three stars of the Great Square make up the wing of our next constellation, Pegasus, the winged horse. His wing attaches to the rear end of his body, and he's got four legs, neck, and a long, horsey nose. To the left of Andromeda, we have her boyfriend, Perseus the hero. He's got a tall, thin, triangular hat, a head, body, legs, and feet. His right arm is curled up behind him, while his left arm is reaching out for Andromeda's upper foot. Use binoculars or a small telescope to look about one-third of the way between the tip of his hat and Cassiopeia to find the double cluster, two very pretty and relatively compact open star clusters. Somewhat low above the southern horizon is a kind of invisible line where the zodiacal constellations can be found. This line is called the ecliptic and is also where the sun, moon, and planets move along. This is why the zodiacal constellations were so significant to astrologers. Not that astronomy scientists believe in the pseudoscience of astrology. Most don't. But astrologers were some of history's first astronomers, and for their early work, we are in their debt. Our first zodiacal constellation is Aquarius, the water bearer. Though unless you're at a really good dark sky sight, I'd skip trying to find him as he's quite faint. As you can see, he looks like a man holding a vessel of water that's spilling as he runs along. Next up is Pisces, the fishes. Pisces is also pretty faint, and you'd have to have a pretty dark sky to see it. But I had to mention it because it contains a planet we haven't seen since June of 2019, more than a year, Mars. Mars will appear as a fairly bright, somewhat reddish-colored star, and is still close to opposition, meaning Earth and Mars are as close together as their orbits allow for this year. This gives our best views of the planet when looking through Earth-bound telescopes, which I fully recommend. Our next zodiacal constellation is Aries the Ram. He's also somewhat faint, but as you can see, he has a small triangular head, a body, a cute little tail, and outstretched front and rear legs, as though he was running around in the starry fields. Finally, our last zodiacal constellation, and the last constellation of the evening, is Taurus the Bull. He's got a big, somewhat triangularly shaped head, two horns, front and back legs, a body, and a tail. Take a look at the tip of his right-hand horn, and you'll notice it's not a single star, but a small cluster of stars that kind of resembles the Little Dipper. That is the open star cluster called M45, or more commonly, the Pleiades. The Japanese call it Subaru, and if you look at the medallion on the front of every Subaru vehicle, it shows those stars. Use binoculars to look at it. It's actually quite beautiful. And that's it. There are other, smaller, or fainter constellations out there, which I encourage you to look for using a good book and maybe a pair of binoculars, too. Speaking of good books, I cannot more highly recommend the book The Stars, A New Way to See Them by the author H.A. Ray, who you may know as the same author who wrote the Curious George books. Ray was a scientist who wasn't satisfied with the way modern star charts are drawn. The astro-scientists were not interested in the characters, objects, or stories behind the constellations, so for convenience they just connected the brighter stars into weird geometric shapes, slapped on their Greek names, 
many of which would mean nothing to the common person, and left it at that. That's all fine and well for them, but for us regular folk, we're more interested in the fun stuff. If you really want to learn the constellations, get Ray's book, which can be purchased from Amazon.com for about $12. I'd also recommend getting a pair of binoculars before getting a telescope. Binoculars are cheaper and easier to use, and there are many wonderful deep sky objects that can actually be best seen with just a pair of binoculars. They are noted in Ray's book. If you do want to get a telescope, ask us or research on the web how to make an informed purchase. Be warned, there are a lot of bad telescopes out there with cheap components and shaky, muddy, fuzzy views that will disappoint you every time. A good scope will inspire you and your children to a lifetime of deep space exploration and an appreciation of science and nature in general. If you're interested in getting into the hobby of astronomy, joining a local astronomy club can be most helpful. Chabot is partnered with the EAS, the East Bay Astronomical Society, which has many activities and resources you'll find essential to help you get started in this amazing and beautiful study of our natural universe. Thanks for watching this video. If you like this content, be sure to click on the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell notification icon to find out when new content has been uploaded. This will really help our channel to grow, which would make all of us very happy. And we'll see you in the future. Okay, well, I hope that was educational for you. Uh, there are quite a few uh, interesting constellations up uh, this time of the year, and one that Don didn't talk about that we're going to talk about quite a bit uh, next month is the constellation Orion, which is very low in the eastern sky right now. Uh, but over the next few weeks, it's going to get higher and higher, and pretty soon it will be well up in the night sky. And there's some really interesting uh, objects in Orion that you can look at with binoculars or even a small telescope. So uh, we'll, we'll be talking about that next month. Now, one thing that uh, wasn't mentioned in the video uh, is an event that's coming up on Monday. Uh, actually, we have two events coming up on Monday. Monday is the winter solstice. Uh, it's the official first day of winter. And we call it the solstice because uh, as because of the tilt of the Earth, as the Earth goes around the sun, uh, we reach a point where the sun has uh, moved farthest to the south uh, in the daytime uh, from the perspective of those of us in the northern hemisphere. So if you've been paying attention to where the sun is uh, each day, you, you'll notice that at around noontime each day, it's pretty low in the sky still. Um, and it reaches its lowest point on the 21st, actually very early in the morning on the 21st. And then each day after that, it will be a little bit higher again at noontime. And we call that solstice, meaning the sun has stopped. Uh, and that's because uh, during the fall, the sun is each day getting a little bit lower and a little bit lower. And then on the solstice, it stops getting lower. And then the day after the solstice, it starts getting higher again as we get back towards winter. Now, that also means that the uh, period of daylight on Monday will be the shortest period. So we often refer to it as the shortest day of the year, although technically, uh, it is not the shortest day in terms of, you know, the time from sun, sunrise to sunrise or from noon to noon. It's the shortest day in terms of how long the sun is up. The, the actual shortest day in terms of measuring, say, you measured uh, the exact moment that uh, the sun was at noontime and you 
measured how long it takes the sun to get around to the exact same position the next day, the shortest day is actually in July. Uh, that's because of the way the Earth orbits around the sun. Uh, but the shortest day in terms of how much daylight you have, that's coming up on Monday, the winter solstice. But another event that's coming up on Monday that's getting a lot of attention is the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. So uh, Jupiter and Saturn are up in the sky right now, and they have been moving closer and closer together from the point of view of those of us here on Earth. Now, they're physically not getting closer together. Um, Jupiter orbits around the sun closer to the sun than Saturn does. Jupiter takes about 12 years to orbit the sun, whereas Saturn takes about 30 years to orbit the sun. So periodically what happens is Jupiter laps Saturn. So from our perspective, they seem to be lined up, uh, but they're not lined up perfectly. Uh, the two orbits are not exactly parallel. They're close to parallel, but they're not exactly parallel. And because of that, each time Jupiter laps Saturn, sometimes they're very close, and sometimes they're farther away. This coming Monday evening, they're going to be unusually close. Uh, so close that if you were to just glance up at the, the two uh, planets, you might mistake them for one bright star. In fact, I've heard a lot of people refer to it as the evening star, or I'm sorry, not the evening star, the Christmas star, because it's happening close to Christmas time. In fact, they're gonna be so close together that they haven't been this close together on a conjunction since the year 1623. So it's been almost 800 years since they've been this close together. So it's gonna be really spectacular. And one of the cool things is that they're so close together that we can point a fairly powerful telescope at the, the two planets and they will both appear in the same field of view of the telescope. That is very unusual. And we're going to do that on uh, Monday evening, starting at five o'clock. We are going to point uh, Chabot's 36 inch telescope, uh, the one we call Nelly. We're going to point it at Jupiter and Saturn, and you'll see both of them in the same field of view of, of the telescope. It's going to be really cool. Now, again, from our perspective, they appear to be uh, 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 right next to each other. But in reality, there are about 420 million miles apart at that time. So I've got a couple of slides that I wanted to share with you just to kind of talk about what's going on and what to expect. So bear with me here for a second while I share my screen. Yeah, maybe. So bear with me here for a second. I'm not the most computer adept individual. So sometimes I have a little trouble with things like this. So hang on just a second here, I found it. All right, here we go. Okay, so this is what's been happening in the night sky. If you've been watching Jupiter and Saturn in the night sky, they were pretty far apart in uh, October. Uh, Jupiter was quite a bit brighter than Saturn, but they were still kind of close together in the sky. But each night they've been getting closer and closer together. And again, this is because Jupiter is orbiting around the sun faster than Saturn. So Jupiter has basically been catching up with Saturn. At the same time, uh, the Earth has been moving in its orbit around the sun. And so the position of the two of them in the sky has shifted farther and farther to the west each night. So on Monday night, uh, let's see if I can do this here. On Monday night, you're gonna see something that looks like this. Low in the, in the uh, uh, southwestern sky, 
uh, right after sunset, you'll be able to see the two of them and they'll be so close together, it'll look almost like they're one, one star, but it's actually the two planets right next to each other. Um, and if we were to look through a telescope, like I say, we would see both planets in, in the same field of view of the telescope. Now this is a simulation here, it's not an actual image. Um, but this happens right after sunset. So we're going to start our program at five o'clock uh, in the afternoon on Monday the 21st. We will live stream it on both Facebook and YouTube for on the, in the Chabot Facebook page. Um, and we will keep the, the telescope pointed at it as long as we can. Uh, as the Earth rotates, the two planets will get lower and lower in the sky, and eventually they'll be too low for our telescope to point at them. But we figure we're going to get probably around 40 to 45 minutes worth of observing, starting at 5 o'clock, and you'll be able to see both planets in the same field of view. Now, <clears throat> Jupiter's a lot brighter, so it's going to be a little bit tricky for us to get both of them looking correct, but uh, we will see both of them, and, and you can join us, and we'll invite you to ask questions if you have them at that time. Um, and then I've got one more picture I want to show you here just to, to emphasize what's going on. So here, let's imagine that we're high up above the sun out in space, and we're looking down on the solar system. Here's the sun right here. Here's Jupiter's orbit closer to the sun than Saturn's orbit here. And Jupiter has been orbiting, like I say, faster than Saturn. So it has now uh, caught up with Saturn. And here's the Earth down here. And so you see that it's kind of a straight line so that we end up with um, Jupiter and Saturn appearing from our perspective to be uh, almost right next to each other, almost on top of each other. Um, and that's what's gonna go on. Of course, in reality, like I say, this is about 420 million, 430 million miles between the two of them. Uh, but it'll be a really cool thing to see uh, on Monday night. So we hope you'll get a chance to join us, all right? Okay, um, that is about all we have for the program tonight, but I do wanna encourage you if you've got any questions. Uh, one of our uh, Chabot staff members here, Jessica Williams is on with us right now and she is uh, uh, monitoring Facebook. If you've got any questions you wanna ask about the night sky, now would be a great time to post a question up there and she'll uh, read it to me and we'll try to answer it. So uh, Jessica, if you're on there, um, let me know if you got any questions coming. Gerald, yeah, um, one question came in. Are there any recommendations for a good first binoculars for a young child? Oh, good question. Um, binoculars come with a rating uh, and typically it'll be a rating that's something like seven by 10 or eight by 42 or something like that. The first number is the magnification of the binoculars. And binoculars, some typically easy to hold binoculars are somewhere between seven and 10 X. Um, and then the second number is the size of the aperture, the size of the lenses on the front of the binoculars. And what I'd recommend, especially for um, younger uh, astronomers is that they uh, get a pair of binoculars that's something like uh, an 8 by 42 or 7 by 42 or maybe 7 by 10 that's light and weight uh, and fairly rugged in construction but light and weight so they're easy to hold um, and what you'll find is even with just a pair of binoculars, you can see an awful lot. Uh, you, if you use a pair of binoculars and look at Jupiter and Saturn on Monday night, you will see that there's two separate planets there. Uh, in fact, you will also see that they have moons. Uh, you should be able to see several moons of, of Jupiter, although one of the moons, one of the brightest moons, Ganymede, 
is actually going to be in the same line of sight as Jupiter. So it will be in front of Jupiter from our point of view. Uh, we probably won't be able to distinguish it very well because it tends to blend in with the background of Jupiter. But uh, the, the moon Ganymede is going to be passing in front of Jupiter. But anyway, uh, a pair of binoculars, uh, 7 by 10, uh, 8 by 42, something like that. Not too big, not too heavy, uh, so that they're easy to hold. And uh, you should uh, have a lot of fun with them. And one of the things you want to look for, and this is usually hidden when you first look at a pair of binoculars, but most good quality pair of binoculars actually have a, a threaded hole on them that allows you to mount them onto a tripod or some other kind of support. Um, and most of the ones I've seen, the, the threaded hole is on the front where the, the uh, joint is between the two um, uh, oculars. Um, that joint has a, a button on the front of it. You unscrew that button and there's a threaded hole there. And that uh, thread is the same threading as you see on a camera mount. Now you have to buy a special uh, a mount to mount on the camera mount and then screw into that, uh, that hole. But when you do that, now you have a nice sturdy support for your binoculars. So that's a very worthwhile investment to, to get that and, and makes it a lot easier to hold the binoculars nice and steady. If you don't have that, uh, find yourself a tree or the side of a building or something to hold the binoculars up against to keep them steady while you're looking at um, the planets or whatever else you're looking at. All right. Any other questions, Jessica? Jessica. Um, all right. It sounds like you sort of touched on this, but the next question was, can you watch the conjunction with binoculars? It sounds like you can. Yes, yes, you can. Yeah, you can watch it with your naked eye, but what you'll see is that the, the two stars are not, or the two planets rather, are not quite overlapping each other. They're, they are separated slightly. Uh, so from with the naked eye, it, they'll look kind of elongated and fuzzy. Uh, and if you've got really, really sharp eyes, you might actually be able to distinguish that there's two different planets there. Um, there's a, a pair of stars in the constellation Ursa Major, the Big Dipper. Uh, in the handle of the Big Dipper, there are two stars, Algol and Mizar. And they are very close together. Uh, and uh, a long time ago, people used to use them to test your vision. And if you could see that there were two stars there instead of one, then you had really sharp vision. Uh, the separation between Algol and Mizar is actually going to be, is actually about twice what the separation between Jupiter and Saturn is going to be uh, on Monday night. So it's actually even a tighter grouping than, than Algol and, and Mizar. All right. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Um, question from six year old Brooklyn. Why do stars look like they're moving from day to day? Okay, good question. There's two uh, reasons for the stars to be moving across the sky. One is the rotation of the earth. As the earth rotates, the, st the stars nightly move across the sky from east to west, just like the sun moves across the sky during the daytime because of the rotation of the earth. At night, the, st the stars move across the sky because of that same rotation of the earth. But the earth, in addition to rotating on its axis, it's actually orbiting around the sun. And as it orbits around the sun, our view of the stars, the distant stars changes because we can only see them at night, which means we can only see the stars that are on the opposite side of the earth from the sun. And as the earth orbits around the sun, that view changes. And it changes, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if six years old sounds like you may not understand this, but it changes about one degree per day. And so each night, if you looked at where a star is, say at exactly 10 o'clock on the dot on, on a certain night, you would find that it arrives at that exact same spot about a minute or about four minutes rather earlier the next night. Um, 
And that's because as the Earth orbits around the sun, the, the whole sky is shifting a little bit each night. And so there's, there's the two motions that we have, the, the motion caused by the rotation of the Earth and the motion caused by the Earth's orbit around the sun. Okay. All right. Um, and the next question is about uh, the winter solstice. Mm -hmm. And the uh, person asked that they've seen some websites that are showing winter solstice live at Stonehenge. And what is the significance of that? Okay, Stonehenge and a number of other uh, architectural structures, especially dating back, you know, thousands of years, they often built them to align with uh, significant events, astronomical events, and a typical event would be the solstice. So they would uh, build these structures so that uh, some element of the structure was actually aligned with the solstice or aligned with the, uh, the what's what we call the equinox, which is in the fall, uh, or aligned with the summer solstice and so forth. And that just means that, that uh, for example, at uh, Stonehenge, there are two big blocks and there's an observing point. And when you stand at just the right location on the solstice, uh, at sunrise, the sun is right between those two blocks between from from that observing point. And so that's actually pretty common. There are a number of ancient architectural uh, structures that have some sort of alignment like that with um, an astronomical object, uh, usually on a, on a key date in the year. Awesome. Um, we have another question from four and a half year old Cameron. Why are some planets brighter than others? Uh, another good question. And there's a couple reasons. Uh, one is how close they are. Uh, another is how big they are. And a third is what they're made of. Um, so a planet, uh, let's, let's take Jupiter, for example. Jupiter is a very big planet. Uh, it's 11.2 times the diameter of the Earth. So if you looked at a globe of uh, the Earth, let's say it was a one foot diameter globe that you had on your desk, if you wanted to make a globe of Jupiter that was the same scale, that globe would be 11.2 feet in diameter. So Jupiter is much bigger than the Earth. And that alone means that Jupiter reflects more sunlight. The light we see from the planets is reflected sunlight, just like the light you see from the moon is reflected sunlight. And the bigger the planet is, the more surface area it has to reflect light. So that's one of the things that makes it brighter. But another thing is how close it is. Uh, right now, we're actually getting a little bit farther away from Jupiter, so it's not as bright as it was earlier this year when the Earth and Jupiter were closer to each other. So as the Earth moves farther away from Jupiter, Jupiter gets dimmer and dimmer. But when the Earth was at what we call opposition, when the Earth was right in the line between the sun and Jupiter. That's when we're closest to Jupiter and that's when Jupiter appears brightest to us. Um, and then there's also the composition of Jupiter or any of the planets. Jupiter is covered with clouds and clouds reflect a lot of sunlight. So it makes it very bright. Now compare that to Mars Mars is not covered with clouds. What we see is the ground on Mars and that ground is a little bit darker. It's uh, got a lot of uh, uh, iron oxide in it. So it looks like the red surface of a, of a desert. Uh, so it doesn't reflect quite as much light. So that makes Mars, even when, though it's closer to us, it makes it dimmer. Plus Mars is much smaller than Jupiter. Now there is one other element that only affects a couple of the planets and that is what we call phase. Some of the planets have phases just like the moon does and the ones that are uh, have the most noticeable phases are Mercury and Venus because they are closer to the sun than the earth is. 
And just like the moon can have a crescent moon or first quarter moon or a, a gibbous moon and so on, Venus and Mercury can do the same thing. And that's because at certain times, we don't see the full lit face of Venus. We only see a portion of the lit face. And so uh, not as much light is being reflected toward us because most of the light is being reflected away from us. And so when we look at Venus in a telescope, we see it as a crescent. It's like a little miniature crescent moon. Um, and it's just because of the, the phase and the fact that not very much of the, the sunlight is being reflected in our direction. It's being reflected away from us. So, so size, composition, distance, and phase. Those are four reasons why a planet can look bright or dim. That's great. Um, it looks like we don't have any more questions at this time. Okay. Well, I know we're getting close to Christmas and some of you are already celebrating Hanukkah. Uh, I want to wish everybody happy holidays and we are going to do this again next month and we're going to continue doing it until we can finally open up and get you folks up back up to Chabot and, and enjoying all the, the new exhibits we're going to be building and so on. So until then, I want to encourage you to support Chabot by hitting that donation button on the Facebook page or going to the Chabot uh, website uh, and, and clicking on the donation button at the top of the page. And then I want to remind you also about our teacher membership matching program. Uh, if you uh, sign up for a annual membership on the Chabot website, uh, Chabot will match that with a free membership for a local teacher. So that's a great opportunity to support our local teachers, you know, who are having a pretty rough time of it with the, with the pandemic. So we want to help them out as much as we can. And also, I want to remind you about the balloon drop on the 31st of uh, December at 11 o'clock. Uh, go to the Chabot uh, website and sign up for that. It's ChabotSpace.org and uh, enjoy that uh, celebration of the new year. Um, well, I think we're all going to be glad to see 2020 slip into history. In fact, I've decided that uh, I, I, I'm so upset with the year 2020 that I've decided that I'm going to be the same age on January 1st of 21 as I was on December 31st of 2019. So I'm just canceling the year completely. All right. Okay. Well, thanks for uh, tuning in 